3. Soil Improvement Bare soil is damaged soil and occurs only where man or introduced animals have interfered with the natural ecological balance. Once soil has been bared it is susceptible to further damage by the elements, sun, wind or water, or a combination of these, or mvasidden by flat weeds. Thus, the use of the conventional plow in cultivation not only damages soil life processes, but may cause more extensive soil losses. The three main approaches to minimal soil loss in agriculture are, L growing forests and shrubberies to protect the soil, L using plows that do not turn the soil, and zero encouraging life forms, especially worms, to aerate compacted soils. All of these processes have the same result soil aeration and safe nutrient addition. In order, they are termed reafforestation, soil conditioning, and mulching or composting. The first two deal with large areas, the last with small areas. Forestry and soil conditioning produce their own mulch, while mulch can be applied to small gardens. Often, the pest plants of which we complain, lamdana, gapeweed, blackberry, mullein, thistle and so on, are the attempts of damaged soil to produce a plant matter that will prepare the way for fours one or crop. They are an indication that damage has occurred, that we have gone too far and have lost control of the land. The initial step taken by the Chinese, setting out on their great work of desert reclamation, is to mat the dunes with willow and straw. The trees follow weaving a mat of roots and leaves that stop water and wind erosion, and even, in the case of bamboo root drafts, moderate the effect of earthquakes on their dwellings. 3.1 Broad Scale Soil Improvement Both P. A. Yemans and Jeff Wallace, of the Kiwa Valley, have evolved broad-scale management of soils, to return them to productive and stable use. Neither have been knighted, made national heroes, nor even invited to take up chairs at leading universities concerned with the environment, but that is to be expected. Australia ignores her innovators and sends instead for overseas experts. The importance of Keyline, and the tools developed by both Yemens and Wallace, is that concreted, unproductive and sterile soil may be quickly rehabilitated. Using either Yemens Bunaip Slipper Imp Shake, aerator or Wallace's soil conditioner or both, the result is that compacted soil is lifted gently, not turned over or reversed, aerated and loosened. Rain penetrates and is absorbed, soil temperatures rise, roots grow and die to make humus, weak carbonic acid from air, rain and roots dissolves nutrients from the ground, and the country comes to life again. Apart from an initial top dressing of phosphate or grossly deficient trace elements, no further top dressing is used. When, after a few treatments, a black soil has redeveloped to nine deep, trees and crops can be planted with assured success, and in the case of tree crops, the treatment gives permanent rehabilitation. I cannot think of a single political decision which is as important as the decision of such men to restore soil for it is the products of the soil that allows politicians to survive, as Sir Albert Howard has so clearly demonstrated apostrophe. Such achievements should be available to the world, and their inventors set free as national teachers, to broadcast their skills where they are needed in the third world. Both Wallach and Yemens have shown that in a matter of two or three years, soils which take a century to evolve under forest can be recreated by man. Wallace has recorded temperature rises of up to 11 C in soils under his reconditioned forest. Yemens has shown how water for every farm and clean water at that, is a result of key line. Clean water and healthy soil, these are the foundations of human and social health. Forget chlorination and the welfare state and go to the heart of the problem the basic resources of a nation. To summarize briefly. The results of soil rehabilitation are as follows, living soil, earthworms add alkaline manure and act as living plungers, sucking down air and hence nitrogen, friable and open soil through which water penetrate three easily as weak garhuldenic and onlic. Freeing soil elements for plants, and buffering pH changes, aerated soil, which tays warmer in winter and cooler in summer, 
The absorbent soil itself is a great water retaining blanket, preventing runnage and rapid evaporation to the air. Plant material soaks up night moisture for late rucked, a dead roots as plant and animal food, making more air spaces and DIY backslash in RHC percent backslash oil, anti ticing nitrogen as part of their decomposition cycle, easy root penetration of new plantings, while these are annual or perennial crop backslash, and a permanent change in the soil, if it is not again drawdown, roiled, pound exclamation tilde j, ploughed or chemicalized into lifelessness. Trees, of course, act as long-term or inbuilt nutrient pumps, laying down their minerals as leaves and bark on the soil, where fungi and soil crustacea make the leaves into mulch. Wallace has produced a soil conditioner of great effectiveness. A circular coulter slits the ground, which must be neither too dry nor too wet, and the slit is followed by a steel shoe which opens the ground up to form an air pocket without turning the soil over. See plate backslash iron 2. Seed can be dropped in thin furrows, and beans or corn seeded in this way grow through the grass to make a bumper harvest. No fertilizer or trub dressing is needed, only the beneficial effect of trapeid air beneath the earth, and the follow-up work of soil life and plant roots on the reopened soil. Graphic illustration of the effects of such measures on soil temperatures occur on frosty nights. Aerated soils are frost-free while compacted soils are easily frosted. Wallace clearly demonstrates this effect by growing tropical crops in his Kuwa Valley farm only 40 miles from the snow line in winter. There is only one rule in the pattern of this sort of plowing and that is to drip your tractor or team slightly downhill, making herring bones of a land. The spines are the valley three and the ribs slope out and down slope. As Jeff says, even a child can keep a machine traveling slightly downhill. The soil channels, many hundreds of them, thus become the easiest way for water to move and it moves all earth from the valleys and below the surface of the soil. Because the surface is little disturbed, roots hold against erosion even after fresh plowing, water soaks in and life processes are speeded up. A profile of soil conditioned by this process is illustrated in Figure 3. I Wallace sees no point in going more than 100 mm in first treatment, and to 150-225 mm in subsequent treatments. The roots of plants, nourished by warmth and air, will then penetrate to 30 cm or 50 cm in pasture, more in forests. For disposal of massive sewage waste water, Yemens recommends ripping to 90 cm or 1.5 m, and a trial of this system is being made at Mary Barovai. Below Sewage Lagoons I have scarcely seen a property that would not benefit by soil conditioning as a first step before any further design input. Only very stony or sandy soils cannot be effective, easily treated, here soil treatment is mainly by biological means, but it can in fact be used on football ovals to prevent soggy compaction without seriously interfering with usage. In the same way, Pasture and crop do not go out of production as they do under bare earth plowing with conventional tools, and the ave processes suffer very little interruption. For small gardens of compacted earth, Yemens recommends driving in a heavy fork and gently levering the soil until it cracks open. 3.2 No Tillage Cropping Until I read Fukuoka, there was no satisfactory basis, to my mind for including grain and legume crops in permaculture, but the system outlined in the One Stra Revolutum, Rodale, 1975, seems to have solved the problems of no-dig grain cultivation. Both P. A. Yemens and David King of Nimbin also recommend the work of G. F. Van der Mulen, a tropical agronomist who has published the ecological methods for permanent land use in the tropics. Available from Rannungstrat 119, The Hague, Netherlands. Van der Muelen uses, for example, the Lab Labbin, Delicios K and Lab, under Bore Assis Palm as a perennial system. A friend of Yemen's uses Lab Lab with barley to great effect in annual grain culture. In brief, 
The system combines the usual rotation of legume slash grain slash root crop slash pasture slash fallow slash legume into a single grain slash legume mixed crop. There is every reason to do the same for tree crop systems, including leguminous trees, wattle, black locust, tree lucerne, in any orchard, nut crop or timber crop situation. Any smallholder can, without tractor or machinery, produce a heavy crop of grains and legumes if simultaneous rotation is practiced. The method is very well suited to sewage or sullage disposal from holding lagoons, where no poultry manure would be needed. In this treatment I have combined data from three books, refs. 3, 12, 13, using Fukuoka's methodology, and data from the latter to references, 12, 13, to evolve a no-dig and permanent grain crop system that fits into the permaculture system. Grain crops are an important food source, and are available within a season. Most areas suit grains, and legumes are the essential plants to fix nitrogen from the grain crop. A grain-slash-legume diet gives a complete protein supplement C diet for a smart exclamation slash planet, Francis Morlapke, foe slash Ballantine. The principles of continuous mulch, with clover, plus double cropping using winter and spring sown grains is what makes it possible to use small areas, 400 mz or less, to support a family of five on grain. If paddy rice is to be grown, the area must first be graded or leveled, and a low bund water wall, built around the plot, so that 50 mm or so of water can lie on the ground in December, see ref. 12 for technique of sealing bund walls with plastic. After leveling or preparation in summer, the area has lime or dolomite spread over it, watered in, and made ready for autumn planting. To start the continuous crop system off, a complete seed-free, mulch cover of straw, sea grass, shredded paper or sawdust etc. is applied at about 900 kg slash L O O O R N. 8,000 pounds slash acre. If no mulch is available, seed can be covered as usual, by raking in. I 3.2 will deal with more than one plot here. To show how different plants can be treated. Rice lies until spring, and other crops germinate soon after sowing. Assuming that the rotation has been proceeding for one year, and that crop straw is now available for mulch on site, the year then proceeds as follows. April, a thin layer of chicken manure is broadcast over the area. Use clover at 1 kg per ha. 1 pound slash acre, rye and other grains at 7 to 16 kg per ha, and rice at 6 or 1 kg per ha, 5 to 10 pounds slash acre. Use inoculated clover if this is the first crop. Seed can be scattered first, then straw covered, thus protecting it from birds. In the second year, rye and clover are sown into the ripe rice crop at this time. The rye and other grains are sown mid-neanth. May, first week last year's rice is reaped, the crop dried on racks for two to three weeks, and threshed. All rice straw and husks are returned to the field. Unhusked rice is now as am within a month of harvesting, just before the straw is returned. June-September migrate to a sunny climate, or admire the winter crop. Light grazing of the winter crops by sheep or geese assist the stooling of plants and will add manure. Check and sow any thin areas as soon as possible. When the crop has reached 150 mm or thereabouts, about 100 ducks per ha, 40 slash acre, will reduce pests and add manure. Fields, or paddies, are kept well drained, October. Check that rice is growing, and re sow thin patches if necessary. Novituba, rye, barley, etc. is harvested in the middle of this month, and stacked to dry for 7 to 10 days. The rice is trodden, but recovers. When other grains are threshed, all straw and husks are returned to the fields, moving each straw type onto a different plot. December, only rice remains. Summer weeds may sprout. These are weakened by flooding for 7-10 days, until the clover is yellow but not dead. Rice grows on until May harvest. January-March, 
the field is kept at 50 to 8,090 saturation under rice, while seeds of other grains are prepared for sowing in April. The cycle then continues as before, but now using the crop straw for mulch. Each person must evolve their own techniques and species mixtures, but once a tycle is perfected there is no further cultivation, and straw mulch is the only weed control, it helps if the area of buns around the crop is planted to coprosma, comfrey, citrus, mulberry, lemongrass, tree lucerne, pampas, or other weed controlling shelter plant. Mulch with sawdust under these borders to prevent weed reinvasion from the buns or surrounding land. Where a paddy is not possible, dry land rice or other grain species can be used, and spray irrigation replaces summer flooding. In monsoon areas, summer rain should suffice. For amateurs, seeds should be sown at the higher rates until skill in even broadcasting is achieved. Mechanical spinners can be used for larger areas. Where rice cannot be grown, for example very cool areas. Other grains may be substituted and short-term cycles may be invented. Spring wheat or corn sown in September, for example, with oats, barley or wheat as winter crop. Other legumes can also be dried. Logs and 12 gives sources for seed and small machinery and data on home processing for threshing, husking and grinding. The Kazairo Ripple Flow Machine, now made in Australia carries out all these processes plus the chaffing of grain stalks. In humid climates, grain should be dried to 14% moisture before storage in best proof barrels or drums. In clean tilled ground the amount of seed needed is 4-5 to five times as much as in this straw mulch method. Fukuoka's book gives much more data on no-tillage gardening for vegetables and fruit, and for the tree crops he used 12 wattle trees, silver wattle for example to the hectare, 5 slash acre, instead of clover. Fukuoka 3 has maintained this no-dig cycle for 25 years, and his soil is improving, with no fertilizer other than chicken second duck manure, no sprays, and no herbicides. Where sparrows are a problem, the grains are mixed with mud, pressed through wire mesh and rolled into small balls, or dampened and shaken in a tray of clay dust to form mud-coated pellets. Pellets can also be formed by extruding mud and grain through a domestic mincer, onto a vibrating table of dust or floor. 1. Grain Crops Rice, ot v come se fiver, although a short day cereal suited to latitudes to 40 n. A des. Would be possible or even a probable success in cool climates. It is self-pollinating. The UN. Notes that rice responds to nitrogen. Fukuoka's chicken manure. The Japanese control disease in seeds by soaking in 40% formalin diluted 50 times with water. The margins around the paddy fields should be mown or planted with shrubs or tall perennials to reduce weed invasion. Wild grasses act as reservoirs for disease. Again, Fukuoka scythes wild grasses and ignores sprays and insecticides. Seed at about 13% moisture is stored in a cool place. Good yields may reach 3,004,000 kg slash ha. Or about 3,500 dibs slash acre. L88 bushels equals 5,200 dibs, sometimes 116 bushels, plus. Percent juk of straw per hectare, 8,000 dibs slash acre J3. These differences in yield illustrate how much more efficient is the straw mulch system. Rye seconds and I ear realage, a long day plant suited to cool areas, usually winter grown but some spring types are available. Ripens in about 37 to 71 days. Pollination is by wind, autumn planted April June, at 55 to 60 kilograms in irrigated ground. Some nitrogen is needed on poor soils. Requires good moisture, one irrigation, at flowering. Ergot is removed in a 20% solution of common salt, seed is then rinsed and drained leaving germination unaffected. Crop must be threshed within a few days of ripening, and plants cut at the wax ripe stage, otherwise spikes dry out and seed starts to shatter when husked. Store below 14,070 moisture. 
Good yields reach 2,800 kilograms slash ha. About 2,400 dibs slash acre 13, 5,700 kilograms slash ha, 5,200 pounds slash acre or 88 bushels. You ear, triticutness viviton, a long day plant for cool areas. Some varieties are grown in Alaska. There are both winter and spring wheats. Needs a sunny period of six to eight weeks for ripening. Well drained and heavy soils are best. Self pollinating. Species will not cross pollinate over hedge barriers. Sown at 40 to 80 kilograms slash ha, 36 to 72 pounds slash acre. Responds to nitrogen. In dry areas, flood irrigation is useful. But this should cease when grain is filled. Cut when seed is doughy and fingernail will still dent seed. Dry in field, thresh, and store below 21 vo 14% moisture. Good yield is 1100 kg slash ha, 1000 dibs slash acre 13. Barley, hordia and vulga, a long day plant for cool areas, subtropical to arctic. Spring types mature in 60 to 70 days. Winter types in 160 days. Self pollinated. Sown at 70 to 120 kilograms slash ha. 64 to 108 ibs slash acre, under irrigation in autumn, or at 13 kilograms slash ha, 12 ibs slash acre, in mulch 3. Control ergate as for rye. Has less pests than wheat. Grain must be hard before threshing, straw dry. Store at 14% moisture in cool dry conditions. Good yield is 3000 to 3500 kilograms slash ha, 3300 to 3850 ibs slash acre 13, 4700 kg slash ha, 5200 pounds slash acre, or 22 bushels. Buckwheat, figure per MSP. F. Esculentium, F. Tartaricotin, F. Etnogenitotin, suits a wide range of climates. F. Esculentiotin is best for cool moist climate. Wide range of soils, even in fertile and poorly tilled or acid soil. Pollinated by insects, needs, and is liked by, bees, at two hives per ha. Frost tender. So only after all frost danger is passed at 25 to 40 kilograms slash ha, 22 to 36 pounds slash acre, not more, or less seed is produced. Lime may help, few diseases. Normally harvested at 10 weeks, when seed at base is fully ripe. Threshes easily. Seed may be dried on floor. Good yields 42 million and 4,400 kilograms slash ha. 3,800 to 4,000 pounds slash acre. An excellent green manure for poor soils. Oats, a Venus 8 diver, a. Byzantina, long day crop of winter and spring varieties, best in cool 3.2 climate. A. Sativa best winter crop in cool areas. Neutral soils of many types, dry loam best. Self pollinated. Lodges, falls, with high nitrogen, so needs less of this than other grains. So at 5200 kilograms slash ha, 45 to 180 pounds slash acre, in September October for February March harvest, or in autumn for winter vatieties. Water needed at flowering. Harvest when straw still a little green, grain at hard dough stage. Store below 14% moisture. Good yields at 3,000 kg slash ha, 2,700 pounds slash acre. Quinoa, Chinopodium quinoa or canoa, C. Pallida corda, grown in S. America are high altitudes, Peru, Argentina, C. Quinoa ripens in 135145 days, canoa in 165172 days. Tolerant of soils and salts. Spring sown at low 15 kg slash ha, 9 to 13 percent pound slash acre. Birds a problem. Plants are pulled when seed resists finger pressure. Bile in stacks to dry. Good varieties, 
1,000 variety is available, yield 2,000 to 3,000 kg slash ha 1,800 to 2,700 pounds slash acre apostrophe i. Tef, Eragrostis Riff, Neutral Day Length. White seeded types suited to summer dry season, brown seeded to summer wet seasons. Drought resistant, but needs shelter when flowering, suits a wide range of well-drained soils, grows well on sandy soils. Self-pollinating. So in spring for autumn harvest at IO 12 kg slash ha, 9 to 11 pounds slash acre. Thin if necessary. Harvest when green panicles turn gray. Yield 2000 kg slash ha, 1800 pounds slash acre. A millet, red millet, white millet, broom corn, treat as for maize, below, planting soaked seed 10 days later than maize at 9 kg slash ha, 8 ibisc. All varieties grow quickly and need little water. A good crop to use where other grains have missed in earlier plantings. Cross or self pollinating. Harvest when seeds are ripe, hang heads in barn. These can be fed directly to poultry, like sunflower heads. Seed stores well. Birds are a PRC backslash bm with miller crops, poultry appreciate seeds. Maize or sweet corn, popcorn, as ways, a short gay plant, yet suited to 40% or n. And subtropics. Stand slight frost only. Varieties seed from 50 to 130 days. Prefers well-drained, neutral soils. Cross-pollinated by wind, so needs tall windbreaks to keep varieties pure. Often followed by wheat or barley, rotated with bees, peanuts, soya beans. So November-January when oak leaves are as big as squirrel ears, or soil temp. Is 60 apostrophe. At 15 to 30 kilograms slash ha, 13 percent slash 27 pounds slash acre. Thin if necessary, to 1,200 to 1,400 plants slash ha, 490,560 plants slash acre. Needs less nitrogen, more phosphate and potash than other grains. Irrigation at dry periods increases seed yield. Sweet corn harvested at milky stage and frozen, or seed cobs allowed to dry on plant. Can be stooked in fields, husked and fed on gob to poultry, pigs, or the seed may be stripped off and stored. Yields 1200 to 1500 kg slash ha, 1100 to 1350 pounds slash acre. It is also possible to graze off the lower leaves with lambs and then turn pigs into the field to harvest cobs. Cattle and poultry will scavenge remains, if any, but then few stalks are left to mulch, and straw must be borrowed from elsewhere. A good interplant for this grain is climbing beans, twine on corn stalks, or broad beans. Melons or pumpkins can be produced at ground level in sunny areas. 2. Pulse and legumes, hedgerow and doyle plants. Broad beans, Vichafabia, long day, cool climate plant. Frost hard. Lime heavy loams, drain well. Bees help seed set, but self pollinated. So April June at 200 kg slash ha, 180 pounds slash acre, 35 to 40 plants slash em. Some manure important for phosphorus, or rock phosphate. Cut before top buds ripen. Stack to dry. Yields 1,500 kg slash ha, 1,350 pounds slash acre. As well as seed, tops can be used as a green vegetable, and young top pods eaten green as they form. If stems are hard cut after harvest, they resprout the following autumn. Vetch, Visha SPP. Especially V. Ervilia, Long Day Cool Climate Pulse, grows on dunes. Wet soils. V. Panica best for heavy soils. V. Ervilia for cold resistance. Produce more seed on less fertile soils. Self pollinating, but helped by bees. Often followed by maize, wheat, or can be mixed with barley, oats, rye, or wheat. 
so February April or as a winter crop at 40 to 50 kilograms slash ha, 36 to 45 pounds slash acre, or 20 kilograms slash ha, 18 pounds slash acre, with 40 kilograms, 36 pounds, of grain oats, 80 kilograms, 72 pounds, of rye. Best sown with oats, as seeds mature together. Not usually irrigated. Cut when lower pods ripe. Ervilia is the later ripening variety. Oat and barley seeds readily separate from vitch. Store dry. Yield to 1000 kg slash ha, 900 pounds slash acre, on heavy land, I slash. Ervilia lentils, lens culinaries, a long day plant for Mediterranean climates, or as a winter crop in tropics, very hardy to frost. Self-pollinating. Often sown with barley in rows to m wide, alternating. Does not need much nitrogen, has few pests. So at 30 to 80 kilograms slash ha, 27 to 72 pounds slash acre, ripens I. L 90 to 150 days. Harvest when lower pods brown, bundles pulled and dried over several days. Flailed or threshed if with grains. Avenue yield 6001300 kg slash ha 540900 acre. So in June August or November August in med. Semit. Chickpea, Sivaririnatu, a day neutral plant requiring cool weather for best growth. Can stand low temperatures. Matures 90 to 100 days. Needs well drained soils. Self pollinating usually follows wheat, rice, oats. So in September and November as a spring crop at about 40 to 60 kilograms slash ha, 36 to 54 pounds slash acre. Often irrigated in dry periods. Harvest when seed well developed but green, leaves reddish brown. Pull or gui, stack high two weeks in field. Flail, yields 900 kilograms slash ha, 810 pounds slash acre, under Eryx Ryan apostrophe apostrophe. F semicolon cj slash c slash slash sku, pi dot wtt 7 saravu 177, long day plant of cool moist climates. More damaged by higher temperatures than by eost. Self pollinating. Often precedes wheat. So in August November at IOU 159 kg slash ha, 90 to 135 pounds slash acre. F backslash tash useful in wet climates. Water at blossoming, and again just before pods form, or at half full if no rain. Harvest by pulling or cutting when peas split without mischief. Uck released. STNC Kalo 15 days dry to 15,070 moisture. Yield about 1,000 kg slash ha, 900 dib slash ak. Pim, luperlis sp comma exclamation tilde, long day or green crop preferring cool climates, grown as summer or winter annuals, maturing seed, if needed, in 100-150 days. Prefer neutral light soils. Bees are main pollinators. Often grown after peanuts, prefer grains, or even useful to pie or dot her land, if inoculated. So September and November or March may at 40 to 80 kilograms slash ha, 36 to 72 pounds slash acre. If used as a pioneer, add phosphates. Rabbits a nuisance. Plants cut, if for seed, when pods percent brown, bunched and reshed over wire frame. Average seed yield date 0010000 kg slash ha 720900 pounds slash acre. A new lupinous free variety of the perennial Russell lupin is being developed in the UK. As a human and stock food a sort of perennial pea. Hedge row around fields. Tree lucerne, chet 7 of tils a, small tree io4m. Hardy perennial legume. Early flowering, June-January at lat. 40s. Seeds Jan March abundant seed for poultry forage, foliage as cattle or sheep forage crop. Wide range of soils, clay, clay loam. Pollinated by insects, 
mainly bees. So in early summer, pods F and junior seed as for lupins, above. Stands pruning for bundles of seed pods. Useful hedge plant for H in protection or with coprostna seed as poultry fodder. Used also in double fenced strips as summer cattle and sheep fodder. Prunings used for mulch. Several other hedge row plants are mentioned elsewhere in this book. See section 4.4. Oil plants A. Coal that could be tried on sandy soils is peanut slash potato, intercropped with lupins as green manure. Mulch the area with straw or seaweed over hills and shelter by using Russell lupin perennial, as a windbreak. Beams, hand shelled from raw seed, are planted and can be inoculated if no clover present. Plant after last killing frost October December at 33 kg slash ha, 30 pounds slash acre, rouse 90 cm, seed spaced at 39 cm on ridges, 24,600 plants per hectare or low, o slash acre give max. Yield. Weeds must be controlled by mulch, or peanuts are difficult to harvest. Chicken manure as real scatter helps crop. If rain pour, irrigate every 10 days after flowering. Plants are lifted when leaves yellow and some pods are brown on inside surface, about 120, i 40 days. Need plowing on heavier soils, can be pulled in sandy soils, dried and stripped, oil and seed crop. Modifications to the above systems must be worked out locally, preferably on a small scale mowing weeds instead of flooding paddies for example. Further helpful data is given in Phillips, S. H. and Young, H. M. This book, although oriented to heavy machinery and sprays, gives some useful hints for no-tillage farmers. For example, rye and wheat are broadcast into soybean crops when the leaves on the latter begin to fall the falling leaves hide the seed from birds. Soybeans, or other legumes, I broadcast into the stubble of oats, barley, wheat, or rye, as is Lespedeza, which is autumn harvested. Peas are planted after corn, and green peas are followed by corn. Other crops suited I or no tillage are cucumber, watermelon, tomato, cotton, tobacco, sugar beet, pepper, vetch, sunflower. Soybeans following grain are planted the last week of May or up to three weeks later in straw mulch. The rather mind-boggling problem is to work out useful permutations on the method. If we have, say, eight grains, three of which are winter-slash-spring forms, six legumes, all with different bearing, and seasons of either winter or summer rain, then the possibilities are intricate. Other complications are dry land, spray irrigated and paddy field systems. And, in the case of any but paddy crops, the potential for integration with perennial or tree crop systems. It remains to run trials. One limitation is that spring straw cannot be strewn over the seed of the same crop, and so transmit disease, whereas straw put on in autumn or midsummer rots before the spring crop shoots. There are, then, a confusing number of possibilities to try, and the best way, O oh, proceed is to map the sequences on paper for a number of small garden plots. Try these for your area, and only proceed to broad-scale trials when the trial sequences have proved successful. There is, however, no doubt in my mind that we can evolve several permanent no-tillage rotations with modest trials. What we omit here is the 2 to 4 deal paraquat sprays which are the basis for no-tillage where the high energy, low know-how and agribusiness operators use it. Fukuoka controls weeds and pests by natural means, frogs spiders, straw, flooding or cutting. Labor in the system is minimal, and we hope that many people will run trials on a backyard basis, with chickpeas, lentils, bins or lupins as alternative legumes. Feedback on results would be much appreciated, and successful trials will be published in the Permaculture Quarterly. Why reference three books on grain crops? The comparisons alone are interesting. The Fau Bulletin and Phillips and Young could be characterized as consciously inorganic, Logsdon as consciously organic and Fukuoka as non-consciously organic. 
I think that the sequence is one of evolution in approach and process, the yields increase as the understanding increases, and that about sums it up. Fukuoka has stacked crop rotation by sowing into the preceding crop, and using white clover as a permanent base. Logsdon has rotation well worked out, but separated in time. The FAO has some ideas of rotation, but no system is offered. Just as Fukuoka stacks his grain slash legume system, so he stacks his citrus slash wattle system. It is in this collapsing of the time for successions that he shows sophistication, order in time by apparent disorder in space. So it is with all truly creative syntheses. 3. Distribution of yield. The concentration of yields into one short period is a fiscal, not an environmental strategy, and has resulted in the feast and famine regime in market and fields, with consequent high storage costs. Our aim should be to disperse yield over time, so that many products are available at any season. This aim is achieved, in permaculture, in a variety of ways, by selection of early, mid and late season varieties, by planting the same variety in early or late ripening situations, by selection of long yielding species, by a general increase in diversity in the system, so that leaf, fruit, seed and root are all product yields, by using self-storing species such as tubers, hard seeds, nuts or rhizomes which can be dug on demand, by techniques such as preserving, drying, pitting, and cool storage and by regional trade between communities, or by purchasing land at different altitudes or latitudes. 3.3 Sheet Mulch for Home Gardens Although there was a description of sheet mulch for gardens in Permaculture 1, p. 93, this technique has brought up many questions which I hope this account will answer. The technique is figured in Figure 3.3, and similar methods are described by Ruth Stoughton together with others, published and unpublished, all of whom have their variations. A video film of the author demonstrating the process is available from Wait, West Australia Inst. of Tech. Perth, contact Barry Oldfield, or via Smith's Books Tour, Canberra, contact Harry Smith. Now, the first thing to say about sheet mulching is that it saves a great deal of labor and a great deal of water, while dispensing with material that normally goes into landfill. Thus mulching also saves money for public authorities, and produces an excellent soil. Another appeal is that the system is still free and suppresses all weeds, ivy, onion and spear twitch, kickle and buffalo grass, docks, dandelions, oak sliss, onion weed and even blackberries. Before starting, plant any large trees or shrubs from the nursery as usual. The first step, figure 3.3, is to sprinkle the area with a handful of dolomite and a handful of chicken manure or blood and bone, the latter to add nitrogen to start the process of reducing the carbon in the following layers. Don't bother to dig, level, or weed the area. Your first attempt should be very close to the house preferably starting from a foundation or path which is itself weed-free. Thus, you are protected from invasion of weeds from the rear, so to speak. Now, proceed to tile and overlap the area with sheet mulch material. This can be cardboard, wallboard, newspaper, old carpet, underfilt, old matrices or clothing, rotted palings or thin wood. If you have a garbage pail of non-noxious wastes like tea leaves, peelings, leaves and small food scraps, scatter these first, for the worms. If you have a source of weed seedy hay or like material, bury this also below the overlapped material, so that no weeds follow on. Cover the area to be mulched got completely leaving no holes for weeds to poke through. If you have a valuable tree or shrub in the way, tear paper half across and pull it around the stem. Serve another, at right angles to the first. Go on leaving only dot valuable plants, some dandelions, clover, useful small plants, with their leaves poking out. Water this first layer well, and then apply, in sequence, 75 mm of either horse stable straw poultry manure in sawdust seagrass or seaweeds zero leaf mold or raked leaves or any of these mixed. 
All of these are manurial, or contain essential elements. All hold water well. Follow these with dry, weed seed free material on top, 150 mm of either pine needles casuarina needles rice husks nut shell sea grass, sozura. Leaf mold or raked leaves cocoa bins dry straw, not hay. Bark, chips, or sawdust or any of these mixed. Finish. Water until fairly well soaked. Always put at least 225 mm of cover over the paper, cardboard etc. 300 mm is better, 375 mm too much, less is of no use, so do a small area very well, not a large area thinly or sloppily. It takes about 20 minutes to cover an area some 10 meters squared, and if you have all the materials at hand it is no trouble at all, and looks very well. Now, take edge seeds, beans, bees, tubers, ochre, potato, Jerusalem artichoke, small plants herbs, tomato, celery, lettuce, cabbage, and small potted plants. Set them out as follows, with your hand, burrow down a small hole to the base of the loose top mulch. Punch or slit a hole in the paper, carpet, etc. with an old axe or knife. Place a double handful of earth in this hole and push in a seed or tuber, or plant the small seedling in it. For seeds and tubers, pull the mulch back over. For seedlings, hold the leaves softly in one hand, and bring the mulch up to, he base of the plant. OK. Instant garden. Time to retire. An important thing to do is to quite fill up the area with plants, according to the prior planting plan you had worked out on paper. For instance, chamomile and thyme near the path, larger herbs behind them, marjoram, sage, comfrey, potatoes and tubers behind this, small fruits and fruit trees at the outer border. Any holes can be filled with strawberries, cloves of garlic, onion plants, potatoes, or some such useful plant, at random. If you must use small seed, do it this way, pull back the mulch in a row, lay down a line of sand, and sow small seeds of radish, carrot, etc. Cover with a narrow board for a few days, until seeds have sprouted, or sprout them first on damp paper. Then remove the board and draw mulch up as the tops grow. Root crops don't do well in the first year, as the soil below is still compacted and there is too much manure, so they tend to fork out. Plant most root crops in the second year when it is only necessary to pull back the loose top mulch to reveal a layer of fine dark soil. By the end of the first summer, the soil is revolutionized, and will contain hundreds of worms and soil bacteria. Just add a little top mulch to keep levels up, usually a mix of chips, bark, pine needles, and hay. Scatter a little lime or blood and bone. For permanent beds, do no more but annuals need occasional fresh mulch after harvest, their wastes are tucked under as are all your food wastes from the kitchen. Worms are so active that the leaves and peelings disappear overnight. Leather boots take a little longer, or jeans a week or so, and dead ducks a few days. Whether from neighbors' untended fences, or from the uncontrolled edge of your own cultivation, the mulched area of Zonai is under constant attack from ground invaders. In subtropical areas, kicker, couch or buifalo grasses reach out to smother the pampered annuals. Unless you can afford deep concrete sills under the fence, you must look to nature for the solutions. Lemongrass, pampas, comfrey, bamboo, coprosma and like vigorous, shady or mat-rooted useful plants are immune to the re-invading kicker and a short inspection of your area will reveal more species that do not permit the invader's approach. So plant a living barrier around your protected a rear, mulch it well with cardboard, sawdust or straw, and rest easy from the labor of keeping your border safe. The same approach can be used to contain useful rampant species, so that blackberries can be confined to openings in forest, kumbungi, reed mace, to pond edges surrounded by tea tree, and mint confined by shady dense bushes, rattler than in tubs. Hens make a mess of mulch but ducks can be released in midwinter to clean up slugs and snails. 
Sawdust protects from slugs, lizards and frogs from wood lice and earwigs. Repeat sowing. There is no need to rotate plants in this system, or to rest the ground. Potatoes are simply placed on top of the old mulch, and re-mulched. But then, there is no need to leave room to hoe or dig either, so plants may be stacked much more closely, but preferably in mixed beds rather than in strict rows. By frequent and random replanting, the garden will start to assume the healthy appearance of a mixed herbal pasture. The reasons for this untidy approach are clearly set out in this book, and are relevant to pest control. Weeding. Some strong weeds may force through. Carry some damp newspaper and a bucket of sawdust. Push the weed down in the mulch, put damp paper on its head, cover with sawdust. If, perhaps, 10% of the kiku or twitch comes up, sheet with paper and again, cover with sawdust. All eventually die out under this treatment, leaving the area clear of all weeds, only your plants have their heads in the air. Another ploy is to dig up dock roots, bury kitchen scraps there, and re-mulch. Watering. Water only when needed, that is, if plants wilt. One drought summer in Canberra 77-78, the Anderson family garden survived all summer with one watering about Christmas time. Feel down in the mulch, and if it is damp at base it doesn't need water. Most of your work is in extending the system, filling in spaces with useful plants, and designing the plantings or harvesting. Keep the garden full at all times. In the first year, however, you need to water more frequently, as the rotted and hygroscopic layer of fungal hyphae and plants at the base of the mulch are slow to develop. Newly planted seedlings need water initially, as in normal gardening. Trees make quite phenomenal growth in this system, and bear several years earlier than in clean till ground. The soil improves permanently. Trees may never need fresh mulch, as in a few years the larger trees and shrubs become self-mulching, the herbs hold their own, and only the annuals need annual attention. Potatoes are picked, not dug and the mulch kept up close to them to prevent greening off. They also do better in the second and subsequent years. Never bury sawdust or chips, just put them on top where atmospheric nitrogen breaks down the wood. Worms add sufficient manure to supply the base manure. Keep the mulch loose, don't let it mat, and thus mix lawn clippings or sawdust with stiff dry material like chips or pine needles, bark, etc. This system works. Observation and trial are the rules. Try a small area first, extend later. Now, a little reflection will reveal the social benefits of a domestic sheet mulch. By using all organic wastes productively, you make the grade from consumer to producer, and the very nature of your garbage pail alters to harmless materials. If you extend the mulch out the front gate onto the nature strip, so much the better. Chris Stoltz of Ballarat, did this and soon became a lesson in productivity and an inspiration to his neighbours. The mind boggles at the end result of mass urban mulching. Some surprises. In a few months you will note many free tomatoes, cucurbits, tree seedlings and the like spring up from your mulch. These arise from your garbage pail, or can be deliberately broadcast sown, as sheet mulch is the best way to propagate healthy plants. Judicious thinning, replanting, gifts, and sales dispose of the surplus seedlings. Yet another effect of litter and mulch is outlined in Habitat, v.4th of May, 1977, pp. 16 to 17, where the problem of Phyropora, otherwise known as dieback, fire blight, or cinnamon fungus, is discussed. Litter and mulch preserve soil organisms and the steady temperature and moisture conditions which encourage other organisms hostile to the Phyphoptera fungi. Burning opposes this effect, which explains why well-mulched gardens are less likely to be affected by disease than logged, roaded and burnt forests, and why potatoes grown in mulch are often disease-free and blight-resistant. Somewhere, never in peasant lands, people started to separate medical, food, honey-producing, aromatic, 
and annual vegetables into distinct areas. Modern gardening books seem to encourage this, showing neat plans of categorized layout kitchen garden separated from orchard, orchard from herb garden, herb garden from manual border, border from pond, pond from cacti, and so on. We recommend a total reintegration as the best method of best control, stability and system, and beauty in landscape, with rare mast planting for special and pest-free species, bamboo, marigold, gooseberry, one. Living mulch. Another way to protect desert and tropic soils is to develop a living mulch. Charlie S. N. C. L. L. at Wims Greek, W. A writes that he has large orders for Sturt's Desert P, for just dollar rich usage. Ruth Jennifer Perth, W.A. is using Kern D.U.P.R. Strato, again for M. Tilda L.C.H. in which, or through which, she plants a garden. Delicho's species serve the same purpose in higher rainfall areas. If we can develop such nitrogenous shady matting or carpel, and G. of E.R.H fertility will build, and we can follow with other species. The leaves and stems of droughted ground cover build a humus in time, and pioneer species can take hold. Fukuoka well describes how he converted hard red clay back to orchard using lucerne as his pioneer species. 2. Stone mulch. In stony deserts or dry slope areas, where surface stone is readily accumulable, Stones alone make a permanent mulch around trees. Richard Street Barb Baker, Siway Show, ABC. May 261 H, 79. Instances this technique has particularly beneficiate end saplings in desert areas. Stones are of benefit to plants in the following ways colon by providing shade from intense day heat, by releasing stored heat to the soil at night by preventing poultry or small animal damage to roots, by preventing wind lifting of roots, by providing shelter for worms and small soil organisms, and on very cool nights, by causing water to condense on their surfaces. A variation on this is the black mulch of oil bitumen wastes used in broad-scale desert plantings. 3. Keeping your annuals perennial. There are several techniques developed by gardeners throughout the world to keep annuals in the garden turning over. Leeks are a good example, for if a few are left to run to seed, then lifted, many small bulb and can be found around the base of the stems. These can be planted out in the same way as onion sets, and as Fukuoka 3 points out, leeks should never be absent from a well-managed system. In the onion slash leek group of plants, Many are in any case perennial. Near the door we can plant two varieties of European chives, coarse fine leaves, Asiatic garlic chives, and shallots of various types. Further away, as a border, set out potato onions, which give about 25 for every one planted, Welsh onions, evergreen bunching onions, the top bulbils of tree onions, and plan, the cloves of garlic in the strawberry patch in autumn or any space left in raised beds. Garlic bulbs, if allowed to multiply for two years give a constant crop. If the large pods at the base of broad bins are left to dry and hay mulched in late summer they will sprout in autumn, or the crop may be pruned back hard after harvest and will sprout again. Corn is a good interplant for summer. Seed potatoes can be left under mulch to sprout in spring, and lettuces let go to seed will scatter seedlings around their base for replanting. Parsley and many flat seeded species reseed freely in mulch, and their seedlings can be set out to grow. Fruit and vegetables, tomatoes, pumpkin, melon, placed whole under mulch at harvest ferment and rot, throwing up seedlings for new plantings. Some people keep carrot tops in a dark or cool place, let them sprout again and set them out to grow in soft soil. Others cut their cabbages low, split the stalk crosswise with a knife, let small sprouts start, then divide up the stalk and root mass and replant. All these methods eliminate resowing or making seed beds, and keep the garden turning over crop. In temperate climates the axle shoots of tomatoes and related species can be pinched out and reset as small plants all summer.
the last lot potted and brought into fruit over winter. Peppers treated in this way may be winter pruned and then set outside in spring, and sweet capsicum served the same. Some useful species of annuals, chickweed, amaranthus, need to be encouraged to persist, perhaps by a little soil disturbance or mulch under the seedling plant. Anderson notes how amaranthus is thus grown as an encouraged rather than a CU semi cultivated vegetable grain in Central America. A small proportion, about 4 to 690, of all crops sown can be let run to seed or ripen for scattering under mulch, rather than buying a newer seed crop. The key is to mulch with soft weeds, hay, and like plant material rather than to turn the soil and clean cultivate. 4. Broad scale techniques. 4.1 Planning and even fodder distribution. The age old problem of a seasonal fodder or forage shortage is illustrated in Figure 4.2. Both annuals and perennials in pasture reach peak productivity in spring, with a lesser autumn flush of growth if there are early rains. This at least is the regime of the temperate lands, where winter rainfall dominates. The data presented here is for southeastern Australia, and appears in Fusrara CL Branch Bulletin No. 3 of the Victorian Department of Agriculture. Flock management, as the sale of young stock or the culling of herds after breeding, reduces the summer feed requirements. But it is obvious that there is a shortfall in hit summer and mid winter feed, the former because of summer drought and the latter due to RHC cold and slug growth of plants. It is from data like this that the intelligent agricultural lift can plant tree crop infills 10 lake up RHC gaps that pasture alone eve gs. For example, midsummer feed is provided by carob and honey locust pods, the foliage of coprome, pampas and chetnocerums, and autumn slash winter feed by the same foliage plants plus the great variety of oaks, chestnut, and black walnut. Both these types of feed are basically concentrated and high-energy foods, enabling the more efficient use of dry pasture or rank grasses. Traditionally, and in areas subject to drought, the foliage of krajong, willow and poplar has been slash felled to tide herds over drought. It is far more sensible to use self-feeding systems under forage forest and to pee alert strips of low forage foliage where herds can be turned in for short periods. Schematically we can level out forage production to approximate stock needs, as per figure 4.14.1. A gradual, 4 to 10 year, change over to the correct balance of tree crop species would obviate the need for expensive forest harvesters, feed grain storage and processing, and hay making that is an essential part of pasture only farming we see today. It also suits the comfort and well being of animals who can range into forest when extremes of heat and cold affect them, and occupy pastures in the tolerable periods of spring and autumn. One imagines that this was, in fact, the normal habit of cattle and other large herbivores before weekly felled farms for pasture, and that the non-functional hedgerows of today are the remains of the older forests. As a secondary effect then, less stress is placed on the herds from heat and cold shock and far less energy is needed by the farmer and the flock over the whole year. An estimated is percent of beef yield is lost due to lack of shelter alone. Street Bar Baker asserts that where 22% of the land is planted to productive trees, yields double on the remaining 78% of the land surface, so that no yields are lost by farm forestry, and the gains depend on design planning. If such systems were evolved on a broad scale it is probable that the extremes of drought and flood would also be modified by the forests, and the whole region would benefit from the pasture-slash-forest polyculture. What few farmers plan is a long-range policy of diversification, and this is just what is achieved by forest pasture planning, as the tree products such as carob and chestnut can also be more directly ill onverted to sugars, fuels, glues food additives, flowers, and such products. This is of great value when markets for wool, hides, and meat are in flux, and gives the forest farmer a very great advantage over the pasture-only addict.
who is tied to a single market or product. How the changeover might be made is suggested in the following section. 4.2 Rolling Permaculture for Larger Properties All large properties, of about 20 hectares or more, have areas which can be fenced out with minimal productivity loss. This is particularly true of steep, stony, eroded, or problem soils, awkward corners, and cold or windswept valleys and rises. Such areas permit the development CRF a rolling permaculture which initially provides shelter as hedgerow, and later becomes a diverse forage and tree crop resource. The first narrow, or nuclear plantings should contain many species in almost random assembly fairly thickly planted so that thinnings are available for pole timbers. Processes are, 1. Reduce pests by broad-scale control or netted fencing. 2. Prepare land by soil rehabilitation and liming. 3. Accumulate seed supplies, and plant many species for later assessment. Select good seed and give necessary pre-treatment, soaking, boiling etc. For Mark selected strong seedlings with pegs for later mulching and experimental treatment with fertilizers, seaweed solution, blood and bone, stable or poultry manure. An excellent ploy is to M, ulch within empty tires around trees. This protects from wind, rabbits, and drought. Thorn or thistle mulch in tires discourages small browsers. 5. Gradually introduce poultry or light livestock into the area watching for damage. 6. Assess and shift or add fences as the system proves itself. 7. Cull poorer specimens for pole timber, leaving selected high-yielding or strong trees and shrubs to continue growth. A rolling permacutter has the following beneficial effects, provides a sheltered nesting, lambing or calving place, and increases meat production, enables early diversification into honey and pollen production enables later diversification into a wide range of animal and plant products, nut crops, etc. buffers climatic effects, particularly that of drought. This alone may double yield in protected fields, provides on-farm liquid fuels after simple distillation, prevents soil erosion, especially wind erosion and water loss, reduces need for heavy fuel consumption as annual crop is reduced in area reduces groundwater table and prevents salting of the soils, and provides drought-proof and cold-proof concentrated feed for stock in periods when pastures are at low yield. In a world governed in its economics by the cost of energy, farmers need to be fully aware of the potential of polyculture. A one better system can fail on one factor. As a local permaculture is zoned, so are farmers zoned from market, hence, Supply centers. Increasing distance means increasing cost and greater reliance on home production of vital materials, especially manures and fuels. Attention should be given therefore to the tree species selected, with respect to local needs and distance from the market. 1. On, farm and urban production of fuels from plants. It is taken for granted here that every farmer needs to be a gardener. For if his commercial enterprises founder on fuel cost or markets, then at least he can still live off, and on, his farm. The importance of the house and garden goes beyond this, however, as it is in the garden and nearby that he can try out small-scale techniques of low-energy agriculture to be applied to larger areas, and produce the seedling trees and shrubs for permaculture planting. The critical importance of low or no tillage grain and starchy root crops, of sugar rich carob beans, plums, or sugar cane and beets is that all can be fermented to alcohol fuel. Every householder and farmer can thus produce a clean burning fuel for cooking, light, and essential transport. Most areas have legally or illegally a gifted distillation expert, although, not surprisingly, we hear little of this as a government-encouraged enterprise. It is the very basis of self-reliance that is available from such crops, and the payoff is that the protein value of fermented foods is not reduced, but enhanced. Dried waste grains yield 20-25% to 25 protein. Simple amylase columns, 
pipes filled with amylase culture on glass beads or quartzite pebbles. Convert cellulose waste to glucose, hence alcohol, so that a grinder converts garbage and straw to fuel with no great problem. Housed in a greenhouse, the byproducts are heat and co. mulch and food. No critical materials are lost, but all products not directly utilized can be recycled via animal feed, pig, worm, fish, to plant food, thus closing a solar cycle that will fuel every tractor or motorbike needed for essential use. The technology is simple, well known and widespread. Any details we have on this process are updated at intervals as a standard design, see Appendix I. Only very simple tools are needed, mainly tanks. A simple flour and water dough may be used to seal any vents in stills, and it is humbug to pretend that any community cannot easily produce a liquid fuel, plus the basis for stock feeds, preservatives, cooking fuels, and so on. The delays, one must believe, due only to the unwillingness of public utilities to give up on centralized and polluting power, and of government support for oil companies, not people or farmers. Australia, ABC News, July, 79, will spend two to three million dollars on PR. To save petrol, but the same amount spent on the low-cost fifteen thousand dollars, distillation plants that would make a community or small town self-sufficient is not available. The intention is obvious, we are expected to stick with petrol or gas products, lead and pollution, until the oil companies gain control of alcohol fuels. Most high-performance cars now run on alcohol, as do 60% of Brazil's vehicles. But the pretense is that we need research to develop this in Australia. Hogwash. Again, the only possible response is to build our own local plants and to resist central control as this would mean great energy waste in the transporting of raw materials to process plant, and alcohol back to farm. On farm production and roadside sales are the real solution, and one which is now available. Dr. Dick McCann, from the Department of Chemical Engineering at Sydney University, speaking on the ABC Country Hour, July 19, 1979 reports on a simple still he has developed for on-farm use, and gives some yield figures for fuels from crop. He estimates that 5,000 to 8,000 i slash ha slash annum. 458720 gall slash acre slash annum, from sugar beet, and a tenth of that for wheat, 500 l slash ha slash a 45 gall slash acre slash arm. Thus wheat or grains give a lesser yield but still give a more useful residue for stock feed, any area where sugar cane or sugar beet can be grown has the advantage of a product with a direct ferment to alcohol. Grains, wastes and cellulose must go through other preliminary processes such as sprouting, boiling, grinding and enzyme activity to first produce glucose or sucrose before fermenting to alcohol. Any group of farmers could easily fund an on-site tank, as could any small town. About five to ten thousand and seventy of farmland devoted to fuel production would provide fuel self-sufficiency, with some surplus. Less area would be needed if we develop tree crops, and less again if that crop is carob or sugar-producing tree crop. Farmers and city waste centers are the potential future energy base for essential fuels. For lubricants also, castor oil and jojoba products suffice. With bicycle freeways increased and more efficient trail, canal, and sea transport and solar power, any society would be self-sufficient in the essential transport needs. Like small stills, small hydroelectric plants are possible, though as yet these have not been mooted, although many farms and towns have nearby falling water or swift flowing streams. Again, the problem is the centralization of power in large utilities. We may yet live to think of the petrol crisis as a blessing, if it leads to sane regional self-sufficiency, or a curse if it leads to the use of atomic power and a desperate scramble for the world's remaining fossil fuel resources. The fact that some 20,000 US. 
Farmers now use on-farm stills should put an end to the excuse of further research and any delay in implementation of this renewable resource. On vehicles, Victor Panek of Wisconsin, has developed a very light fiber grass car, the body made from local grasses and a modern glue. Fueled with alcohol, this vehicle would serve farm transport needs in both the West and the Third World. Like the old baby Austins, such vehicles need only small, 5 to 7 HP. Alcohol motors, but modern design gives them greater efficiency than the older vehicles. Perhaps the most cogent argument for alcohol fuel is that the insidious lead pollution from car exhausts is eliminated, thus alleviating health hazards in cities. The long-term advantage is that the heat budget of the planet is not adversely affected, hence the threat of climatic change due to the burning of fossil fuels and the felling of forests is also avoided. Looking at unemployment, there could also be positive spin-offs in this area. Every 6 to 10 hectare devoted to fuel production would support a family, and any farmer would find it worthwhile to employ, or lease out land, for fuel production. The same employee or producer could plant long-term crop in the time available between annual beet or can crop, such species as carob would be invaluable for fuel as the bins are 68% sugars. Thus fuel forests could be established on each farm that needed collection rather than annual cultivation and manurial input. The byproducts of increased glasshouse production and high-protein animal or human food would pay production costs, so that such fuel is free to the producer. If the money is now devoted to the creation of new, and unpopular, freeways were diverted to local alcohol-producing plants, the evils of unemployment and the energy crisis with its accompanying expensive fuel, would disappear, and we would have time to think again. In suburbs, all food and cellulose wastes could be used to generate fuel via mylase columns, and end the humbug of waste disposal costs. Sometimes one can be pardoned for thinking that we are all crazy, or dumb, or that there is a gigantic conspiracy to keep people down and out. I am inclined to think that both factors are operating. 3. Orchards Except for the scale of the plants, orchards are little different from pastures, the legume-slash-tree mix parallels the legume-slash-grass mix of permanent pastures, therefore we can best commence any orchard by planting legume small species like white clover, lab lab and lucerne, larger acacias, albizias and locusts, and a scattering of leguminous shrubs. The second element, after legumes, are scavenging poultry. There is no reason at all why the legumes chosen to support the orchard should not also support poultry on range. Even cursory observation will reveal to any interested person that fruit and nut species under which poultry or small livestock, wallaby, sheep, are allowed to range are more vigorous, healthier trees, showing less lichen, dead branches, and very little if any, insect attack on fruits. Conversely, trees or orchards where cattle or horses are allowed to browse show severe damage and disease. In permaculture then, the orchard is planned as a poultry range, so that the larger perennial legumes locusts, tree lucerne, podlaria, were interplanted not only for nitrogen fixation, and to break up the monoculture, but to provide poultry fodder as seeds and berries. All fruits are useful fodder, but elderberry, mulberry and craetagus species are of high value. For some reason, litter under poultry runt trees is more plentiful, that is, natural mulches are thicker, leaf mold is constantly being turned over by hens, suckers from trees are less, and water absorption of the soil better, while grass mats are rare and many persistent weeds are absent. The process to follow is simple enough prepare the whole site by soil conditioning, set out the leguminous species, and interplant the selected orchard trees, allowing small animals to forage below the system as best control and manurial elements. Pigs, autumn, geese, winter, ducks and poultry, all year, are suitable livestock. Tree lucerne, for bees, top trimmed as goose forage in winter, add nitrogen and provide bee fodder and control ground pasture. Hazel as edge species, small fruit understory, 
and perennial flower or vegetable crop for inline plantings are also helpful. Trials of black, red and white currants, gooseberries, lucerne, tree lucerne, clover, narcissus, perennial dahlia, Jerusalem and globe artichoke, agni, and the like will reveal successful species for sight. Any deciduous trees removed as diseased can be replaced with evergreen, fewer, citrus, loquat, olive, and the situation varied by long-term interplant of chestnut, walnut, almond and plum. Should you be so unfortunate as to inherit a monocultural orchard, remedial measures follow much the same plan, add three to four hens, a pig, and s six large wattles per 1000 meters squared, via acre, with many smaller legumes. As decoration and variety, plant fuchsias, banksias and nephophia for the insectivorous birds, borage and white clover for the bees, and keep a keen eye on developments, using judicious mowing and adding more species as the system evolves. Planned variety gives a good display at wayside stalls and enables direct marketing of varied products, from flowers to fruit and nuts. Precisely the same number of fruit trees can be grown for commercial use even though the acreage may need to be expanded to accommodate the entire plant species, but savings in pest infestation and fertilizer use more than compensate for the need to disperse the system, while secondary yields increase the total income, and free the producer from the fluctuations of a commodity market or a rapacious processor. 4. Pruning, Necessity or Habit Almost all fruit trees available from nurseries have been shaped in such a way that later pruning is essential. Most books on tree culture give data on pruning. Few bother to question why a tree is pruned, but some reasons are as follows, ease of spraying and harvesting, maximum size of fruit, reduction of leaf and increase of fruit spurs, even ripening due to even light penetration, removal of diseased parts and small tree size for small areas, greater density. All of these are admirable ends, if the aim is a commercially produced and even product. They are not necessarily the aims of permaculture. Unpruned trees have the following features, less risk of disease from cut surfaces, smaller but more numerous fruit, greater yield per unit, st stronger frames, fit into mixed forest, crop, animal husbandry and uneven ripening, more difficult harvesting or spraying. Ladder and windfall harvest, self-harvest, and far less work offset most of the latter setbacks. 4.4 Woodlots and Hedgerows Woodlots and hedgerows like free-range poultry, farm woodlots may be frequently mentioned but seldom specified as to their use on farms. Rather, Farmers are encouraged to plant trees suited to central processing for wood pulp, or for off-farm, commercial markets. However, many on-farm needs also exist, and these may be, fuel, from high sugar crops, structural, fences and buildings, forage, winter and summer feed, and shelter, which can be provided by species suited to forage or structural use. Some very valuable trees, such as black walnut, not only produce young trees for structural use, but may be sold out as rootstock for grafting, and at maturity n, era the farmer to retire on the crop income, timber of great value. Very high durability. 70 years or more in the ground. Strawberry jam acacia, black locust, catalpa, almost all cedars, juniper, river red gum, one pine. Long durability. 30. 70 years. Chestnut red mulberry osage orange bald cypress redwood honey locust white oak Tasmanian tor wood macrocarpa oyster bay pine desert oak celery top pine. No doubt this list can be greatly expanded, but from any such list the farmer can choose shelter belt, hedgerow, and cattle or poultry forage species, bee forage and plants which yield foliage or fruit for distillation, as oils or alcohols. Some suit arid, others riverine or coastal conditions. Some, most of the conifers, are useful mainly as timber, and are therefore less generally useful in the system, as well as being slow growing. Plant barriers may be erected, with or without supporting fences, 
for a variety of reasons, to contain or exclude livestock, to shelter gardens and houses from wind, to increase the efficiency of wind and sun, to prevent reinvasion by unwanted plants, and to screen unwanted views and sounds. It is the first of these categories that is most difficult to satisfy. Almost the only tree one know which stops everything, but needs no pruning is Lycium furosissimum, or African boxed horn, and it will stop bulls, lions, and weed invasion, resist salt spray and gales, and feed poultry, the latter also disappear into it without recourse. In coastal sandy areas, the crown tends to spread gradually to about 7 m wide, and plants may seed down. But the cost of uprooting seedlings every 50 years or so is small compared with the frequent attention needed to keep less ferocious hedgerows tight. This, then, is the ultimate hedge barrier for broad-scale, large livestock containment. Cautious browsing by stock sometimes occurs, but an established lyceum hedge is a stable, wide fence, in pastures and on heavy soils it has no tendency to spread as seedlings. Lyceum compounds or bomas of dead branches will protect plantings of more useful trees, and clipped branches will deter rabbits if strewn around seedlings. Others recommended jujube and rosa multiflora or rosa yugosa for equally formidable barriers, both need hard stopping or pruning in their first few years. Logsdon, that useful man, also reports glowingly on Osage or and Joji FS. America, May. 1978. Hawthorne, Crataegus, species live set at, 60, 90 centimeters, and later led or interwoven with dead trimmings is the traditional livestock hedge of Europe, and Tasmania, but needs cutting to shape every four to six years. All such hedges, are made more efficient either by a few strands of barbed wire strained through them in their infancy, by ditch and bank approaches or by permanent electric wire protection. Logsdon also includes the redoubtable and never browsed red cedar, the honey locust and shingle oak, Quasim brugaria. Cacti too are effective in dry areas, as are unpalatable or thorny local species. Inside the more impenetrable hedges, only woven or netted palisades repel small livestock, but I have seen these made as tight as baskets in the Caspian Sea area where living papyrus uprights, interwoven with dead stones, are used. The beautiful Middle European woven fences illustrated by Williams have been duplicated by Tagari, using local wattle, tea tree, melaleuca, or whipstick regrowth, and of course bamboo would serve equally well. Combination weave and thorn quickset hedges are fairly quickly established, but for the non, 4.4 grazier most of us, less fierce hedgerow is needed. Procter, in his most useful book on garden hedges, gives a wealth of detail and species for a great variety of soils and exposures, with much data on hedge propagation. So much for the exclusion of livestock, we come now to plant barriers as windbreak systems. It is essential that windbreaks do what they are intended to do, that is, break the force of the wind as well as performing as many other functions as we can build in. Some of these are, act as fire breaks where this is a crucial factor, store up emergency fodder for a variety of animals, make it easier to cultivate, or to use implements, provide bee forage and insectivorous bird cover and nesting sites, give at least some girl wood for construction timbers, contain at least some species which can be used to diversify farm product in emergencies and conserve soil and clean runoff water, and prevent erosion. The shape of the windbreak should be very much that of the sun trap shown in figure 4.5. Trellis on walls, earth banks and dam spoil will create other and more local sun traps. When we come to productive wind shelter, cattle excluded, mixed hedgerow of Prunus, Crataegus, Coprosna, Millus, Crabapple, Hazel, Bamboo, fuchsia and vines are wonderful wildlife and forage habitat. Again, enclosures of bamboo or fields of bampus grass, passpolum, sudax, tea tree and like thick set species are essential winter shelter for newly shorn sheep, use in lamb, or for emergency snow retreats for wildlife. 
In dry areas we look to tall tamarisk, casuarina, mulga, acacia and eura, eucalypt and similar drought-proof trees to protect the soil from desiccating winds. This also applies to the reduction of evaporation in open ponds. Within the confines of the annual garden, clipped coprosma, tree lucerne and luca enna supply not only wind protection, but manurial mulch for their leaves and branchlets, or material for the straw yard. Against the burning of salt winds coprosma, nimas japonicas, sea buckthorn, hippophilumnoids, fedges of scramblers such as tetragonia impulgza and tall stands of pines are our defense. Temporary summer windbreaks are provided by sunflower, Jerusalem artichoke, belts, not rows, of pole beans and corn, and autumn winter clumps of broad beans. But in very severe winds perennials are necessary. Tiny hedges of clipped rosemary protect small herb gardens and a scalonia nacrantha or wormwood gives a soft silver edge to seaside gardens. A certain series of plants will halt invading couch grass, twitch, oaksless and the like, these have either matted roots, bamboo, pampas, lemongrass, or have very dense foliage, comfrey, coprosma, lyceum. Of such hedges we can border our inner mulched and controlled areas. Some of these barriers can be reinforced with marigolds, against twitch, to the inside, oaks and pines without, and so resist or totally prevent ground weed incursions into gardens.